So M.M. is uh, it's, it's, it's a fintech company that's focusing on um, investment management and support to investment from purely based on artificial intelligence. Um, it was founded by Tommaso, as as reporter said, and by um, his, his childhood friend and now co-partner Federico Mazzarin. So as you know, both last names start with an M, hence M.M. Um, what, what's very important for us is that, that whatever we do is very deeply science rooted. I think it's important, especially in this context now where um, a lot of companies pop up and say they would do AI, you know, drill down on that question, see where does that confidence come from, where does the information come from, and how are the models are built. And one thing I also want to say is, uh, I think about it, you talked about the magic of AI, what we always say it's, you know, uh, AI is just a tool and it has to be handled properly. And so what we want to show today is also, you know, what you can do with it, but also that there's no reason to be um, afraid or too cautious about what AI can do. Um, we have a, a very large team now, and this is split up between <laughs> our in-house uh, data scientists and physicists, and we also partner with six universities, which is called the M.M. Lab. And this is very important for us. So the M.M. Lab is doing a lot of like ground research for us and working with different universities, you know, allows you access to different philosophies, mindsets, ways of approaching problems. And one of the key issues you will hear again and again within AI is that it can only produce good results if the whole setup and the data that's going in is very unbiased. And so we, um, you know, we have offices in London, Milan, and New York. Um, so we are set up on a nicely global scale, which allows us also to capture the trends in all of these regions. We do basically two things. One is we, we manage money for our clients in a very bespoke way. And it's about uh, around a billion, a little bit more than a billion in, uh, in assets under advisory that we have. And the other part uh, what we do is we make our investment, our AI accessible to clients. And it could be in, uh, in a platform that gives you basically online real-time access and it gives it to your hand. Um, so this, there we support at least $70 billion in assets um, directly and you know quite a bit more directly. Um, let's look at what, what the, the market and the industry thinks about AI. And this is quite interesting. So uh, the CFA Institute, which is basically the leading institute within the financial world for investment professionals, says that 84% of investment professionals want to integrate AI in their investment process. And you know, even the last couple of years, you have seen how this is going up. Um, you know, the question, of course, comes to why would you do that? Uh, and one of the reasons, of course, is that and Deloitte showed it very nicely in a study that it does increase productivity, but it also allows to increase your assets under management and your revenues. One point that's also interesting, which we haven't added to the slide yet, if you think about the companies that right now really take it seriously, it might be only 20% of all asset managers who have really implemented and worked with it. So there's it's a big, big, big space that still needs to be covered. Um, and what do some of the, the big industry, most sophisticated leaders say? So if you look, uh, listen to Ray Dalio, the founder of Bridgewater Associates. He said, AI is extremely powerful and Bridgewater, we use it to work in parallel with our managers to produce better investment decisions. And Kenneth Griffin from Citadel says, balancing the influence of new tech like AI with the power of human mind is key for better decision-making in the financial markets. And as you see in both of that, none of these people would say, we rely completely on AI. And we're going to make the case today that this combination of AI and human creativity is it's a fantastic way of moving forward. Um, so why do we talk about all of this and why do we talk about it now? So there are a few reasons. One, of course, financial markets have become more and more complex, right? There's more data out there. There's more information out there. Um, if you go 25, 30 years back, having information was a key differentiator to building good portfolios and creating uh, very good returns. So this is not a problem today. Information is there, but how do you find it? And here are just a few numbers, and I, I won't go through all of them. I would say just two I would like to pick out. One is in the bottom. So 90% of the data that exists today has been created within the last two years. And that's a development that won't slow down. And just to give you a rough idea how much data is out there, there's a little bit further to the right, 175 trillion gigabytes. So if you would put all of that data solely in music, 
you could listen to music for 300 billion years. So it's a lot out there. And what does what what's the problem with that? Since you look at something, and you know initially it's not very clear how it looks like. So you have to take a step back, and then you know you suddenly very slowly start to form a picture until you grasp it everything. So getting this full picture from this mirror of data to find the one that's actually useful, and then find the right connections that give you insight that lead to better results, that's the key thing. And so what does artificial intelligence then do compared to other things? So one, it can work extremely well with rising complexity, yeah? And it can also, you know, and that's, it learns nonlinear relationships. And this is, you know, something in theory the human mind could do as well, but it would take humans, you know, thousands of years to compile through data and find these relationships where it takes an AI seconds to do. And then the last one, it adapts when market changes. So in the past, when you had models that were purely quantitative, they were working until they were not working anymore. And then you had to step in and, and fix them. So with a good AI, it makes these changes automatically. And through that, it can react to market changes extremely quick. It does that in an unemotion an unbiased way, and this is the huge advantage it has. So with this, I you know, hand over to Tommaso to talk a bit more about democratization we see in these markets. Absolutely. So thanks for the for the intro and, and kind of putting the framework on why AI is relevant today. Yeah, Keith, do you have a question? Sorry, I have a question. You, you, you used the word unbiased, Axel, but if we're saying that the majority of data um, simplistically is from the last two years and particularly with financial markets obviously to some extent we need to look at what's happening in a short period of time but also over the longer period of time is there not a sort of inherent call it bias in that there's not enough data in there to take the longer picture and, and the bigger picture but that, that, that's that's an excellent question and so this is you know without going too technical um, what you need to have good AI is a lot of data um, to make sure it can learn properly and can, can adopt properly. What we you know, intentionally exclude is time within this observation. So if, if I look at, let's say, the financial crisis of 2008, and I would look at within a timely context, then there would always be a before and after. This is exactly what you try to avoid. Since at the end of the day, you, well, you do not want to repeat the past, you would learn from the past. And so just having enough data allows you to find these interesting connections and react to things in the future. So that the, there's more data now than in the past, it's not actually an issue as long as there's enough data that allows you to learn properly. So it's about the quantity of data rather than the sort of, it's looking at it in a different way rather than sort of temporal yeah. context. It's volume of data. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. also, you know, we would basically look at, you know, 20, 25 years back. Um, even going further back, that would even more distort the picture since that's a non-comparable market. You know, if you go 30 years back, there was no internet, there was no uh, innovation in that way. So that would actually distort the picture. But if you go over the last 20, 25 years, you have a great amount of, of data that helps you. The beauty, just to add on this, Keith, uh, is that some of the data we can are reliable and we can go back a long time, such as macroeconomic data. Those data that we use and we rely upon, those are we can go back down to the 50s because those are data that are there to describe the macroeconomic system. So in a sense, we do have the long frame picture as well as a more recent uh, and more coherent to the world in which we live in, as Axel correctly presented, uh, which is useful to have you know, an information around the world as a whole, which is very much based on history and as well as a very coherent and, and present picture on the data that we have today. So the interesting, the interesting moment in which we live in is, a, is an era that we could call of AI democratization. What do we mean by this? Um, every complex technology at the very beginning is used exclusively by the people who develop it. Okay, think about the Wright brothers at the beginning of last century. They were the one building the planes. They were the one flying the planes. Six years ago, the first computers, 
people building the computers were the ones using it, right? These engineers and scientists playing, you know, in a big room, because computer used to be a room, an entire room, uh, with, car with cardboards. They were building and using the computers. As technology progresses, it matures so that who develops it is not necessarily the sole user of that technology, right? That is when really technology gets adopted. It happened with, with, with airlines and airplanes, it happened with computer, and it's now happening with, uh, with artificial uh, intelligence as well. Up until a couple of years ago, the only, up until really a year ago, the only people who could use AI were the research analysis, the, the people, the R&D people, uh, the scientists playing with, uh, with the technology itself. Nowadays, we have technology which has been mature enough that can be put into a platform for a broader audience, right? And this has been happening across the board. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a really a, a, a world phenomena. And the beauty is that it's happening across industry. So over the last years or, or year or so even less than a year, we released Sphere, which is one of the first AI platform in the world to create portfolio, et cetera, that makes AI accessible to any professional investor. ChatGPT got massively distributed, MidJourney, uh, Notion AI, and a ton of artificial intelligence got released over the last year. Not because everybody of us got on the phone and decided on the date, but just because suddenly technology and understanding of, of the complex matter of AI happened to reach a critical point in which AI could be democratized. And so I'm going to give you a couple of examples here in you know, areas in, in, in which AI is, is being used, as well as, you know, in the, in the industry uh, of finance. So the first example that we, we pick here is ChatGPT. I'm pretty sure you guys are all familiar with ChatGPT. You must have played with it. Um, we brought here, just because of the audience, a very, a very interesting example. So if you ask ChatGPT to write a non-disclosure agreement, of course, it needs to be supervised, but it can write a pretty good one. And especially... And we start to get into that human and machine role, you can actually ask ChatGPT to make specific adjustments to things that either you produce or the ChatGPT has produced and tailored to the needs. So if this is a non-disclosure agreement, you can actually say, hey, change the term of the agreement to, th to three years, and it's going to write the same exact contract just by changing the terms of three years. And this is a very, very basic example, but it just shows you how much a technology that it's able to write a text um can do can do can do very well into supporting uh, a lot of industry now after the, the webinar we will have a, a space for q a in which we're going to touch upon the difference between analytical ai and generative ai which i think uh, it's it's always an interesting matter to kind of to kind of understand but i'll take that in the q a because i'm pretty sure that uh, you guys would, would have a lot of questions on this second example on really men plus machine and AI supporting and being democratized and, and supporting different activities is a different technology. The example that we bring here is MidJourney. I don't know if you guys are familiar, but MidJourney is a, an AI to do image processing, to create image, generative AI to produce images. And so the example that we bring here is what a friend of mine who's a graphic designer did for work that she needed to do. She said, she basically had to design a cover for a magazine. And she said, generate a new image based off of the style of the one attached. But this one is of people skiing in the mountains with a chalet on the background. And then she uploaded her own way of drawing people. And this is what MidJourney produced as the first image. Now, this is not an image already on the internet or in some database. This is a completely new image based on the prompt, on the indication, and on the input from, you know, given by by this graphic designer. And what, of course, what the AI produced is not perfect. I mean, uh, yes, it's a skiing context, but you know, there's a boat floating in the sky as well as these mountains and people are sunbathing and it looks like they're on a beach. So what she did, and now I'm cutting the, you know, a long sh story short of, of course, of reiteration, but she gave a lot of, you know, detailed suggestions such as make it more of a skiing party in front of a chalet with people wearing ski clothes, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, giving more precise indication. And after a few iteration, this is what the artificial intelligence produced. Then what she did is she edited on Photoshop, color corrected, and this became the cover of a magazine. Now, the interesting bit that I'd like you to focus upon is that this was not produced by the AI or by 
the human itself has been done together through the human creativity, with the creativity as well of the AI who came up with ideas, but then it further edited by the human and then finalized uh, in, in, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a in a in a defined format. So it's been really done together, and this is really what you know the industry is moving across. So a lot of people are asking nowadays: So will AI replace the human? Uh, we say no, but we say human capable of using AI will for sure replace a human not capable of using AI in almost any field. Okay. So what does it you know what does it mean to the world of investing? Now, the world of investing is a, is a very particular world. Uh, it's a, first of all, it's an open envi environment compared to, for example, text, which is a closed environment, or chess, which is a closed environment. The a way to write a sentence are finite. A way to play a chess match are finite. The financial market is never finite. You're always dealing with limited, limited information, and there are always outside factors that you cannot control. Think about COVID, wars, and so on and so forth. So the, the application are slightly different, but where AI is being used today is to do this activity, which is asset allocation, both from a statistic, uh, tactical and a strategic uh, standpoint, portfolio construction, so building portfolio, building uh, and allocating uh, funds and, uh, and, and positioning uh, indicators, stress test analysis, uh, understanding risk expectation and, and, and building expected returns, and basically using that as, as a tool to really complement the investment process. The difference, of course, is rather than being a chat-like technology where you implement a text and that converts that text into an input, this is an analytical technology. So, of course, being finance very technical, yes, we do have a part in which you know, even generative AI and conversational AI play a role, which is mostly to describe what's going on, but the most you know, critical thing is, of course, done with sliders and numerical uh, computing uh, dynamic. And so the activity that investor could do, similarly to what we've seen with ChatGPT or, or MidJourney, is that they can depict a scenario in which they say, look, I'm going to present a scenario based on expected return, on macro dynamic, on market regime dynamic, and then ask Sphere, which is the name of our AI or you know another technology, what is their point of view to address that scenario? Similarly to how um, the graphic designer said, I have this picture and I'd like to create a picture on the base of that, but this one is of people skin on the mountains. Here is similar. I have a scenario. Maybe this scenario is partially created with the AI and partially created by the human. What's the best portfolio in this scenario? Right, and so and then they can change it, tweak it, rerun the analysis, and that's how human and technology are working together in the investment world. So, what is the benefit of this, concretely speaking? Now, if you split down the world of investing, then Axel is going to highlight highlight on exactly how men and human are doing it together. But just to highlight where the value is, every investment process could be. Generalizing to principle, idea generation and portfolio construction. So idea generation is where the people in charge of making, of running portfolios, which could be investment manager, CIO, portfolio manager, head of you know, different departments of, of portfolios, multi-asset, equity, fixed income, etc. So people in charge of making the decision, they have an idea on the market, what they would expect that could happen. And then on the back of that idea, they have to create a portfolio. They have to execute on that idea, right? So this applies in any industry, such as even a good lawyer. A good lawyer might have an, an idea on how to address a problem, a clause, whatever, but then they still need to write it down properly to reflect that idea. Because sometimes the, the devil is in the details, right? You know this very, very well. So in finance, this context, com context could be simplified into intuition or forecasting alpha, which is really the ability of, we say, making the right calls. Statistically speaking, are the people in charge of making decision good or bad? Okay. But then on the back of that decision, and this is often called operational alpha or optimization alpha, you have to execute well. So you could be a good lawyer with good ideas, but then you need to write a good contract, a good uh, uh, 
Parere, a good like uh, uh, information piece, uh, which actually reflects that principle that you had in mind. And that's called optimization or operational alpha. So where can AI add support? It can add support on both of those two things, both on the intuition and on the operational alpha. How? In two different ways. On the intuitional alpha, you have to think that AI has a point of view. Okay, so AI every day looks at a ton of data and keeps creating analysis and forecasting dynamics that you can use within your investment process. And this is what clients are using. It. They have external research, they have their own research, they read a lot of documents, as well as reading the information coming from the AI. And that's very, intu very intuitive, very, very easy to understand. But then the operational alpha is a second piece. Then what they do is they input all this information around uh, how the world might look like in, uh, uh, in the future, okay? Two, three, four, six months down the line. And then you have to build the best portfolio. And a, the AI helps them to balance the risk, the risk along the line. Axel said it very well at the beginning. We live in a world where complexity has really increased a lot. So combining well these risks together actually creates an edge. So that's why the two things, both having an additional support and uh, combining risk well together are actually key to add value. And this is how men and human can use their technology to you, but together. But you know, to further tell this view better, I'll pass it on back to Axel to 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 actually dig deeper on this. Yeah, but that, that's the that's the crux. And I think where you know, if people understand that, that using the AI properly, where the AI is really doing the heavy lifting and being able to go through all this data and then use it in an intuitive way that makes a lot of sense. So usually we would say that um, you know, machine delivers and the uh, the human surprises and you see like our, our marketing colleagues have just work, done very well in the way that they depict the brain um so then going back to the um, the picture that Thomas was started so what does mean between what you should idea generation and portfolio construction now you know you can add an element where the ai comes in right and here is really where it helps to support um your your decision making whether it you know comes up with expected returns it looks at how risk regimes change how market indicators change and it does that quickly so what what we have seen before with sphere our platform that's an interactive platform that gives you real-time access to the ai and you can have that inner discussion you could say okay what happens if suddenly things in the market are much, much better? What does it mean to my investment? And this is a fantastic tool to have. And then, you know, with portfolio construction, then you can you can really, again, you know, make it on the one hand very bespoke to your own constraints, requirements, um, and come up with a much improved portfolio. And then again, you know, the whole thing starts again from the beginning. So we had, one of our clients made um, came up with, with a fantastic, uh, fantastic quote that um, he mentioned, he said, adopting AI in our investment process, giving us an augmented humanity to make better informed investment decisions. This is really in a nutshell. I mean, we, we didn't tell him to do that, to say that, but I think it's, it's, it really summarizes it's great. So let me show you a couple of examples of what that means. So we, one of our clients is a US-based asset manager, made size about 300 billion in assets. And they asked for you know, help in asset allocation, portfolio management, and scenario analysis. So initially, this is how their investment process looked like. They had an investment committee, there's a tactical allocation, there was some input on, on constraints, and of course, how the strategic allocation would look like, and it would come up with the portfolio. So using AI, when they could have an additional input, looking at risk regime forecast, uh, and have an, an optimization process that was very multidimensional meant it could really, really, you know, help them getting a better understanding of how the portfolio looked like. It made it much more robust and much more resilient. Um, another example we would have is uh, from an insurance company uh, in the in the EU, and you know that insurance companies are maybe the most regulated financial institutions with a lot of constraints. So for them, they were able to have a a universe that's more customizable that allowed them to react better to changes in their liability. Um, it was also adding better forecasts and how to come up with an optimization, better optimization. So this was how it looked like initially. And then 
you know, just having historical expected returns, they added again, um, you know, returns that are based on changing risk regimes. Um, and so we could also then add an unbiased tactical indicator that helped them um, reacting quicker to changes in the market. And you know, we also do manage uh, a portfolio for them. So it's all about this adaptability, having an unemotional, unbiased reaction to market changes. Um, and then lastly, oh, that was it. Sorry. <laughs> um, so what are the practical steps for that? And then Tommaso is going to take you through what's very important at, 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 the, out, at the onset to make sure it's a successful implementation integration of AI. So we came up with principle in AI adopting because, of course, uh, this is a new technology. So it's not that people are used to work with this technology. Um, so these are general good principles in this change management, which is not just a change management from an organizational perspective, but really a mentality uh, change management. So our principle for, for AI adoption are three. The first one is customize and integrate. So the goal, which is often uh, easier said than done, even for us, it's almost uh, sometimes it's just an aspiration, but we try our best to, to get there, is AI should adopt to you, not the other way around. So AI has a benefit compared to traditional technology, which is nonlinear, and which means that it does not have always the same output. But that output could be tailored, could be adjusted, it adjusts itself to different conditions. And so this allows to fit better in a process. And so this is critical because often between technology and the human, it's always the human that makes the steps of adapting itself. Here with AI, we have the, the ability that technology can actually adapt to the human. And so that trying to find that thing, that fit is actually uh, very, very critical. Second thing is leverage internal and external capabilities. So unfortunately, AI is not two guys on laptop. Axel explained at the beginning and uh, Roberto as well, we are a quite large research center focusing just on AI. It needs a ton of focus, a ton of R&D and cannot be achieved just, you know, a couple of guys playing with computers. Uh, that's not how it works. And the, the other problem is that technology is, is growing at a fast and, and evolving at a faster pace than, than previously. So every technology that you develop internally, you have to really think, do we have internally, internally the capability, not just to develop it, but then to maintain it, to make sure that two, three years down the line, it actually makes still sense. Are we going to pump the right investment into this field or maybe not? And then we come up with something that maybe it's good for today, a couple of months, but then it comes old in a very quick way. So most likely, every company would need to integrate, integrate external technology, because there are companies that actually have focused in developing those technology and can keep a pace of innovation, which is uh, much faster than you can do. So why do we say leverage internal and external capabilities? Because those companies might have a great understanding and know-how about a certain topic around AI in a certain field, but they don't know your organization, your situation, your processes. So it's really important to work side by side to make sure that the, the value of the both is really is really uh, put put together, and then finally, which is what Axel said very well at the beginning, is having the right mentality. What that CEO of that company said, which is that AI has given them augmented humanity, it actually is really represents this dynamic. AI is not here to replace anybody; it's here to empower everybody. Okay, but but often people are scared. They are scared about a technology called ChatGPT, which can write a text in a fraction of a second. Okay, so the goal is really, and, and so therefore people act upon this technology being very negative, try to see where it fail. We have to have the right mentality, understand where it can add value more than where it can fail. Uh, and so this is really critical. Without this, there could be no challenge, there no, no dynamic. So we actually took a step further and we create a list of five steps that our five steps of AI adoption in this case are for the asset management and wealth management and investment and financial services industry, of course, but this could, could generalize to different industry as well. The five steps are the first one, exploration phase. And this is really done internally by the company themselves. And it's about investigating, understanding what could be the benefit, the different opportunity that, that there are out there to do things better in a more smart way, 
through the use of technology within knowing your process. Then the second phase is what we call partner selection. Because AI is not together in a laptop, you got to find out either you have the strength to put together a team to do it internally, but it, not just do it. Do it, maintain it, evolve it, make sure that three years from the line is still top of the class, or most likely you need to find a partner, somebody who has those skills and it's his only mission as a company is to do that. Okay, this is done very, very well if you already have a rough idea on what you like to, to pinpoint them in areas in your investment process in this case, or your processes in general as a company are a little bit, uh, could, could be improved to a certain extent. Once you select the partner, and of course, by just talking with partners, ideas arise, but once you select the partner, you have to go almost back to the previous say, uh, phase. What we call is what we what we call this phase is investment process support, and it's really decomposing the investment process. Going again, doing the first exercise together again with the counterparty. Okay, then there is training the models. What we said at the beginning, AI should adopt to you, not the other way around. This is where it happens. Where really the technology is trained within that specific environment, and then just at the end there is an integration of that technology within the processes which could be a hard integration or a soft integration, depending on, on the different, different dynamics. So how long does it take usually? At least in the investment industry, it depends uh, from, from industry to industry. So the investment, so once, of course, the first phase, phase it depends on the partner. Once people are you know, committed, it usually takes between three to six weeks. So this is not a massive long project uh, that, that what often people think. Um, also because technology is, is progressing so fast that if it would be longer, you would, be, you would probably be, uh, once you complete it, uh, still behind. So what do we need to get started? And this is really not just the financial sector. This is really every sector. The first one is find the visionary innovator within your company. And this is something we try to, even we actually proactively ask the clients Who's the visionary innovator here to bring this project forward? Of course, by bring by doing these steps, uh, in, and because we're talking about processes, we, it takes you know putting together different people, different expertise, uh, different uh, backgrounds. You need to find somebody within the team that is able to drive this innovation process across the line. Okay, and then finally. This is, you know, specific for the investment industry. The people needed are the investment teams, of course, people in charge of investment process, of course, because those are the technical ones, and operational team often to kind of simplify and smooth, uh, smooth out the process. Now, with this, we would stop here for, for Q&A. Um, if you have any doubts, we can cover maybe some of the context uh, com concept around uh, generative AI compared to analytical AI or numerical AI. What's the difference? What are the application? But um, we will stop here and, and open up for Q&A. Thank you. How do you price Sphere? Is it a, a subscription model? Is it a, a, a monthly thing? Is it a setup and, and sort of ongoing fee? How does that work? Yeah. It's, um, it's, access, yeah. yeah it's, 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 it's kind of a subscription. Um, basis depending on the extent clients want it if it needs to be adopted so but it's a it's a subscription base and and by license so sort of yeah. depending how many people you wanted to, to use okay. it right yeah okay if i may ask um some details on this analytical versus generative ai just uh, to better understand this point absolutely so what is generative AI? Generative AI is a is a, a branch within uh, within AI, where basically models are trained on a series of a large set of examples, and they use this example to come up with new example, new things that have not you know existed before. Often, analytical AI and or numerical AI. A lot of the things that the AI do, does is really clustering things together, associating similar things to not so similar things and finding patterns, okay? Generally, the AI doesn't do that, okay? It relies upon that sometimes, but what it does, it actually uses the data to create something new. And that's why it used to create text, inform, uh, images, videos, speeches. So it's very useful where 
you can have a large set of information, okay? And you can use this information to create new information that has never been produced before. Analytical AI, on the contrary, is really useful to understand patterns, understand dynamic, understand how things are moving from one to another relative to one to another in a non-linear way, uh, in a multi-dimensional way, okay? So the two things is not that generative AI is the new AI. The two things have value uh, in the both ends. Let me give a, a quick example. How do we use it internally? We use both generative AI and uh, analytical AI, numerical AI. Of course, all our models or our technology to create portfolio, run risk, understand the scenario, etc. it runs on um, uh, analytical AI because it's a computing problem, right? And also because you cannot come up on how the world you know, will be just making up stuff. You need to analyze how it is and how probabilistic could, could evolve in the future. But we do use generative AI to write a comment on the back of that. And writing a comment, believe me, is not a superficial thing. People always think, okay, it's a superficial thing. Finance is a very complicated matter because we live in the future. So every portfolio, every investment idea is not for yesterday or for today. It's for tomorrow, for one month from now, for six months from now. Okay, so just producing the information, which is uh, you should be exposing yourself to long-term corporate bonds because we think that uh, the ECB or the central banks are low in rates. The, inf the piece of information we think that ECB, given the market condition, will start to lower rates, that is the reason why you should be doing that information. So just the piece of get exposed to long-term corporate bonds is useless without understanding the why and the explainability and the explanation part. So using generative AI to write a comment on models is actually super valuable because it actually increases the explainability, makes it more dynamic, and actually helps clients to really understand why the model is thinking something and why the portfolio is behaving in a certain way. So there is value for the both of them, but it's just different. Thank you. It's very interesting indeed. Um, so if anyone has any further questions, just uh, the floor is open. While your other tenants think of their, their own um, questions, uh, let me put on the lawyer's hat and look at AI as a, as a lawyer specializing in the regulatory aspects of financial and asset management services. Well, uh, I've read in the Italian news, in the Italian financial news, about uh, uh, the possibility, uh, or better, the relationship between AI and market manipulation. And the, 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 that article in the news uh, depicted a scenario where uh, AI systems uh, could learn to manipulate the market by means in particular of automated trading systems and especially high frequency trading systems. In other words, by analyzing trends in the market uh, and big data, an AI could uh, understand that there are instruments uh, to get a better result from an investment by manipulating the market, but having no morality, no professional ethics, the AI could do the dirty job. What, what do you think about that? So is, is there a, a chance or it, it is reasonable to figure out that scenario? Is it rocket science or, or is, yeah. is it something that yeah. could, could happen? I would have two thoughts of that. So to, to really manipulate markets, you know, you would need a lot of players to do that, right? And go in the same direction. So you would have... Basically, we would need a huge group of people trying to do the same thing. Um, 
I think that's very hard to coordinate. And then the other thing, you know, you know, humans can try to do the same. And so this is where regulation comes in, right? What is allowed to do and what's not allowed to do. Um, and you know, what we said before that, you know, AI is doing the heavy lifting. What it is doing is, in theory, something humans could do as well. It would just take humans much, much, much longer. And so I think it comes down to regulation to address that. It needs almost like just a, you know only a faster response. Uh, Tomas, if, if I may add on this, no, 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 I fully agree with you. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I love uh, Roberto that you that you said that uh, you might that you know the machine has no morality, but believe me, the people that are doing market manipulation, <laughs> these are people they, they don't have morality as well. So that's why uh, you know as Axel said, that's where the regulation has to step in. So market manipulation is not so much of an issue, and also because for the other reason that you not know, just to reiterate on what Axel said. If even the AI found an opportunity, believe me, there's going to some, be some, some one, another AI finding the other opportunity. So it's always going to be a battle. So that between the complexity of how many actors need to step in to really move the market and the regulatory element, the, it's not so much of an issue. Where the real issue is, is around information. So the biggest, the biggest problem around AI and market manipulation is very, very simple. Some problems, as I told you, are solvable. Some others are not. So understanding the financial market is not solvable. You're always learning, you're always evolving, etc. Coloring a, a, a screen, which is a made of, which is made my face now in the screen that you guys see, is a series of pixels that go from the top to the bottom, each one colored in a single way. So how long does it take for a system to learn exactly how to color each individual to make me say everything that I want? Everything that the AI wants, zero. So people, mean people, people with not so much a great morality, they can use this technology as it gets better to produce completely false information, but that it looks completely real. Because again, what I'm saying now, my voice and the video that you guys see, it's a series of pixels just colored in the right way. If you do it well, you can make me say and do whatever you can. You, you decide. So by just doing that, you can bombard the world with fake information, different information. So that's where the market manipulation can happen. And if we go back to what Axel said at the, at the beginning, which I think is you know was a very critical point to to keep in mind, is today we live in information abundance, and more than anything, the important thing is making sense of information. Back in the day, censorship worked by not allowing certain people to access certain information. Nowadays, censorship works the other way around. I bombard you with information. You just don't have the power to, to sort all this information. So if I bombard you with certain information, you might think something is real, but it's not. And on the back of that, you can move the market, manipulate the market. You can do a lot, a lot of bad things. And that's really the scary and the... The most difficult thing to be to be addressed, and we're already seeing a little bit of this happening now. But my concern is just going to get worse as time passes by. I mean, this is, and one of, if you get a little bit more on the philosophical side, so one of the things that's most difficult for an AI to learn are values: what is good, what is bad. Because even we disagree on that. You know, there are clearly things where I think we would all dis we would all agree what is bad and what is good. But there are others uh, that's more marginal. You know, you, you look at you know legal systems in different countries. There are, some things are legal in the UK that might not be legal in Germany or in Italy. Um, and so I think this is this is the tricky part. And this is also I think when when people are afraid about AI is controlling everything, that's something you would consider general AI like one system that can react to everything possible that's given to them. You know, think about when when Google came up with um, Google Go. So an AI that was beating the grandmaster of Go. You know, a, a board game that's you know much 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 more difficult than chess. Where is that? That's fantastic. The only thing it could do is play Go, <laughs> right? Nothing else. It couldn't play chess. It couldn't drive a car. It couldn't whatever walk the dog. And so. You have to be aware of that. It's coming back to this AI. It has to be structured properly. This is why we talk a lot about being unbiased and unemotional. So this is very important. But Robert, I agree with you. You know, it, like with everything else, it can be you know mistreated or misused. It's but it's always the human. It's always the human. 
Yeah, sorry, not to interrupt. It's, it's always the human that, 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 that's scary. The AI has, uh, it's just a technology. Yeah. The problem is the, you, the human using that technology, they, they, can, they should be controlled. The thing about what we said at the beginning, we say AI is just a tool. You have to use it properly. Yeah? If you buy a chainsaw, you should know how to use it. And so <laughs> the same with the AI. You know, it, it's the, the, the intention where it goes to what the outcome should be. That's given by the humans. You know, we have a clear proposition what our AI is going to do, what it has to achieve. Just like, almost like a, a number we try to target in terms of how much more efficient portfolio should become. Right. And so if you want to be to do something that is doing evil, you know, you set it up that way, but it's it's the human who's doing it. It's not that the machine is suddenly turning evil. Thank you both for this comprehensive reply. Are there any any other questions? To some extent, this actually substantiates the role of the investment manager or the lawyer or it will at some point, because there's probably going to be a period of time where individuals think, well, I can, I, I can make my own investment decisions because all I need is the right tools, and therefore I'll use AI to uh, analyze the markets and do it myself, and therefore I don't need to pay an investment manager. And then, as you said, Tomaso, the danger is, yes, but where are you taking your information from? Uh, it already happens a little bit in legal sectors where a client will come and say, but I Googled this point of law. Why am I paying you to, you know, to tell me about it? And, and of course, that's far too simplistic. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, they don't understand the nuance. They don't understand the, the, their particular situation. They don't understand the interaction of, uh, you know, uh, if it's an M&A, what the other excuse me, business are doing, et cetera. And so the same is going to happen in investment management, that there may be a bit of a rocky period where it goes a little bit wild west. And then hopefully people are going to come back and say, okay, to make sensible investment decisions, I need I, I need a some I need an organization that is working within a robust regulated framework. Yeah, I mean yeah. I agree that that's part of it. And this is why also, you know, if you think about, and it's all, you know, in the finance case, it's a lot coming back to the kind of data we use. And often, you know, if you talk about AI or like, you know, like our firm who you know, has been doing this you know, within that industry for a very long time, actually, um, you know, we looked at a lot of data, but people usually think you talk about AI and you use some esoteric data. And it's not, so this is not helpful. We, we tried it. It's not helpful. Right, so our data is it's we use market data. So this is prices of securities and everything you can calculate out of it. We use macro data, you know, GDP, inflation, etc. It's very clear. We use fundamental data, so, so company specific data on, on an aggregate sector level. But all of that it's unbiased, right? If you know the price of General Electric today at 10 o'clock at the New York Stock Exchange was what it was. And so this is important. To, this is why, and these are questions that need to be asked. If somebody comes, well, I, I do AI. I say, okay, how do you do that? How do you make sure there's no bias into that? Uh, and this is then, you know, to, to your point, is that uh, this is where the human interaction has to come in and has to help. Like you, what, yeah, what you, and, and, a lot of the results coming out of that. Absolutely, and, and and to the concern that now that there is technology, people will just do things by themselves. I don't know, there are a lot of things that came out in terms of innovation, but still uh, we're relying on someone else to do it. Let me just name one. The, how, uh, what it is, fast cement, okay? Or the, the drill, to, to drill holes in the wall. <laughs> or the, 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 the autom what's it called, automatic screwdriver, whatever it's called. Like still, because it's there. Yes, you might hang a paint uh, here or there, you hang, you hang a picture. But at the end of the day, you still call the carpenter to do it. <laughs> and the thing is that the carpenter can do much more, much more faster. And maybe that service becomes cheaper. Yes, because it can do more, maybe better, maybe which lasts for a longer time. But because innovation comes along, that doesn't mean that uh, like we start building houses by ourselves or cooking food just by ourselves or and so on and so forth. So my concern that people will use this technology by themselves and portfolio manager would not be useful and the lawyer would not be useful 
I absolutely, and even worse in the least, doctors would not be useful because then I can do my own. And I, I don't, I, I really don't see that happening. Uh, just the, but this is not necessarily a problem of technology, the problem of the human mind. We're just, uh, otherwise, we would do it, everything by ourselves and we don't do that. And actually, we can prove that as evolution happened, we actually specialized. Uh, somebody, you know, the Neanderthal man, he was able to do everything, build the fire, find, uh, hunt, uh, fight, uh, build the shelter, find the uh, resources, etc. We can do just a few of those things, but very, very well. And so it is just a tool for professional, each one in their field. So the real, the real question within your organization should be, what type of services from a law firm should we price differently? Should we automate automatize should we make faster where should more senior and more junior people work within the technology that now we have these are the discussion but that not, not so much of a fear for me uh, in my opinion thank you thank you very much Are there any other questions i think we're running late not I invite uh, Roberto to close the meeting and keep. Yeah, uh, but before closing this webinar, let me, if I may, of course, ask a one million dollar question, asking you to answer in thirty seconds. Um, the question is: Should AI be regulated? You know that there are many proposals. Over the world, in particular in the European Union, we have a proposal for a regulation aiming to govern the AI. And if so, so if AI should be regulated, what do you think should be regulated? What aspects of this technology should be regulated? For example, I'm pretty worried about the uh, the training, the database for training AI, should this training be regulated in order to ensure that uh, AI is properly trained? So the input, the, the database used to be to train the AI, be, be, be clean, be uh, properly constructed, includes the, the right data. For example, I'm just making an example, I'm not an expert, of course. But what do you think about regulation? 30 seconds. Okay. So I, I think that AI in itself shouldn't be regulated. I think the use of AI within certain areas should encapsulate that. So if you think about, you know, the, the, the mutual fund industry is regulated. So, you know, is the use of Bloomberg as an information source regulated in it? No. So why should why should you have a special regulation of using an, a forecast for returns be regulated? Thank you. 30 seconds as well. Axel already said uh, uh, the biggest piece, which I, I fully agree with, you, uh, with him. Um, just to add upon, this is trying to regulate AI. It's like trying to stop the wind with your hands. Uh, this is the first, you know, things that comes into my mind. It's it's really impossible. And the regulator themselves, for by nature, the regulator is following up and cleaning where problems emerge, right? Because on the contrary, the regulator would be limiting application. And we all know that limited application would the assumption would be that the regulator already knows what the benefit and the, the, the risk are associated to something, but nobody knows until we try. So Unfortunately, we will have to be, the regulator has to step up in being very, very fast to adjust areas in which the technology, the data, et cetera, are used in a not, in, not in, the, in, in the best way. But it's going to, by definition, be a, a, a learn and, and learning by doing, basically, example. Should it be regulated? Not the AI itself, the application of AI within the different areas, as Axel said.